Uh, okay, I have uh, Dr. Rosalind Paxton-Ratanshi. Uh, she's the director of um, Academy for Health Innovations Uganda. She's a global health specialist who combines research with clinical work. Uh, she trained as a clinical lecturer in genital urinary medicine at St. Mary's Hospital, Imperial College, London, and holds a honorary contract at Cambridge University Foundation Hospital. She has over 15 years experience working in Uganda, and she completed her uh, PhD from Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Uh, Dr. Rosalind joined IDI in 2011, where she served as a head of clinical services. Uh, in 2015, she established Academy for Health Innovations Uganda, whose mission is to improve health outcomes through innovations in clinical care, capacity building, system strength strengthening, and research with strong emphasis on HIV and uh, TB. Uh, the projects uh, that Dr. Uh, we also have here uh, Richard Indahiro, uh, who is technical advisor and he's a, a digital economist at UNCDF. Richard, Richard works at the intersection of digital economy and the real economy, uh, specifically on how digital technology and innovation can be applied to sectors like health, agriculture, education, finance, and energy to enhance access for under served communities. His career of over 15 years uh, crosses through financial services, digital finance, and switch digital inno innovations. So we can see that he's also into innovations, especially in, uh, in supporting the underserved communities. He holds a master's in science in applied economics and a postgraduate diploma in innovation and design thinking, a diploma in professional marketing, and is an alumnus of the Ox Oxford University. Sure. Uh, we have also uh, Kenneth Mohanji, uh, who is a managing partner at KTA Advocates. Kenneth is an accomplished management uh, partner at KTA Advocates, which is a leading law firm in East Africa. He advises as well as represents the Ugandan government on a number of plat platforms, both uh, locally and outside the country. He's also specialized in intellectual uh, property and technology and is passionate about young inventors safeguarding their innovations from fish to blockchain. He, he talks about why going into a market without a, a full uh, uh, proof of plan will result in two millions of investments going down the drain. Kenneth is a proponent of drone technology, not just in Uganda, but uh, African continent, and he makes a clear and coherent argument for greater use of drones, especially in uh, instances where they are faster, more efficient, and sometimes cheaper for, for example, being able to deliver life-saving medications in areas that can not be uh, traversed through traditional transportation. So we can see that he's also uh, into uh, technology. Thank you. I uh, also have um, Ola Supo Oyedepo. He's the director African Alliance of Digital Health Networks and the project director at ICT4 Health Project. Ola Supo is a technology strategist with over 15 years working, uh, working experience across the digital sector, health sector. He's an ardent believer of the power of technology to bridge that and and optimize processes, especially way with health. However, he believes uh, this uh, transformation power of technology should have appropriate country-led ownership and governance if this investment is to be uh, sustainable and impactful. He has worked across the digital health sector, like JSI to grassroots. Ola Super holds a, uh, a master's in digital health governance and currently pursuing a PhD 
in ethical use of artificial intelligence. Uh, we can now go to the uh, first uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Rosalind Paxwatanshi, uh, to give us um, presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Um, some of you have heard about our drones project um, before, um, but I will just give a little bit of an overview of this project for those of you um, who, who um, don't know about it. But before I do that, um, if you will just allow me um, to share um, a little video we have, which kind of summarizes uh, pretty much everything that um, uh, that we want to cover um, are on this. So I'm hoping, um, can you just let me know? I'm hoping, can you just team here? No, 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 can you see, can you see the video on this? Wali tu kwa sebo anyo mbigambo vienta ambula okubevu unge ogenda kudua lirevu sumira. Ngatu otuta ambula, olusi ngatu ita mumazi na yengo luembera yensi ndi. Ngabi tukaluviliza mkulu ato okuta ambula okuva evu unge okutuke evu sumira zili mayo misambu. Na yenga tufuna muko kukunyigiri zivu wakubanga embera yovu denku veto nye entambule ganye na yeka tukuli basa nyufunu kule nkula akula na jetu wakuna kutitungi chafe. Kutusiza <laughs> Thank you. So, so that's just a kind of visual representation because it's difficult to get the idea of, of what we're trying to do in medical drones without being able to, to see the sort of environment um, that we are working in. So our project um, is called um, Overcoming Geography with Technology. So using medical drones to overcome geographical barriers. So why um, would we use drones? Well, drones really are just a form of transport. There's nothing special about them, except that they can be cheaper and faster than other forms of transport. Transport, as we know, in certain parts of Uganda, East Africa can be very expensive and difficult because it's long distances, we're using boats. Certain medicinal products and diagnostics should be just in time. You know, the supply chain should be um, providing things at short notice because these drugs or diagnostics have short health half lives or they're very expensive. That's why we don't give patients long um, refills of ART because these products are very expensive. Some populations are very mobile and they need flexibility. For example, fishermen on the islands move between the islands and we need to get the drugs to where they need them. So the purpose of this project or these projects are to undertake a research project to assess feasibility. That's, is it possible? And acceptability, uh, will it be accepted by the community, by the stakeholders, by the healthcare workers for ART delivery and sample transport in Kalangala Island? And the idea is that we are delivering directly to the patient. That is what is different about our project. Most other projects, you know, have a, have a delivery by a, a parachute um, that doesn't get down to the patient level, but we're also aiming to support health uh, center needs. So why Kalangala District? So Kalangala District is 84 islands in Lake Victoria. It has a very high HIV prevalence and very uh, high loss to follow up because people are moving all the time through their fishing activities and there's very sparse health services. Um, there's a high unmet need for essential services and delivery systems, as you can see in the pictures, are by boat and by bicycle and very challenging. Here are our proposed drone routes in, in Bufamera, and we're pleased to say that we are already delivering um, to uh, Kusu, um, uh, Chitobu, and uh, down here, um, uh, Bukaka Health Centers. We're also setting up in Moyo and Adjumani. 
And the reason for Moyo and Anjumani is these um, uh, places have very long distances and very challenging distances between uh, COVID sample hubs. So we're doing a COVID sample project um, in, in this district, trying to reduce the distances between, or, or trying to reduce the times um, and the turnaround times between the transfer of samples around the district. COVID samples are tested in Adjumani, and they're also tested in Kampala. So all the samples in this very large region have to be moved to Adjumani and to Arua. And what our project is doing is moving between Moyo and Adjumani Health Center to start with, to um, collect samples from around um, this very Northern part of Adjumani and Moyo districts. So how do you build a drone project partnership? In terms of the, 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 the conference collaboration to transform, we cannot do this as one entity. So um, our framework for our drones partnership um, takes into these different activities. So coordination and stakeholder engagement, the approvals and the governance side, the engineering side, that includes choice of the drone, modifications, global drone knowledge, and then flying capacity. We need the technical capacity to be able to fly, to make sure that it's safe um, and, and things are working well. Then underneath all of that, or underpinning all of that in our project, we also have a research layer um, uh, as well. The sorts of challenges in implementation of drone flights are that the cargo technology is advancing rapidly, but it's not yet a well-developed industry. You can't go and buy a, a cargo drone in a, you know, in, in industrial area that you can just put up in the air like you can go and buy a Matatu or a, a, a Boda or, or your car. The communication systems are challenging for long ranges. So the longer you go or the more difficult the train, the more difficult the communication is. And the batteries are difficult. The batteries cannot come by plane on their own. They have to be shipped by boat and they're inherently large and, and unstable. Community sensitization is another key. This is a key amount of our activity. I would say that about 50% of our funding so far has gone on community, district, uh, sensitization meetings, radio shows, talking to the communities. And we have to do different strategies. In Kalangala, it's face-to-face -face talking to the communities on the islands that are receiving the drones. In Moyo and Ajumani, our approach has been telephone, uh, sorry, radio shows, radio discussions. So this is just um, to say that this is a big partnership. Our, our funders for the two projects are Janssen and UNCDF. We then have multiple drone um, specific partners, Uganda Flying Labs, We Robotics, 3D Drone Mapping, Bar Aviation. And then of course, we've had regulatory and authority um, support from uh, uh, UPDF, um, um, uh, Ministry of Health, uh, Chief of Defense Forces, Ministry of Defense, Uganda Civil Aviation Authority, uh, Makerere University School of Public Health Ethical Review Committee, and Uganda National Council of Science and Technology. Uh, thank you, and back to you, Joan. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rosaline. Uh, I just wanted to, to really find out exactly what inspired you uh, to start the drones project. Mm. Uh, uh, thanks, Joanne. I mean, Joanne, Joanne is the project. No, oh, just hold on. Joanne is Dr. Rose, yeah. I wanted to find out what exactly inspired you to begin that drone project in uh, Uganda. Okay, can you hear me now? Um, thank you, Joanne. Joanne is our project coordinator, so she's had this story before. So I think um, Ernest Larko was saying earlier on, we can't just have technology. We have to have technology that uh, solves problems. I did my PhD in Kalangala Islands, uh, Kalangala District, um, and Masaka uh, District, and I saw firsthand the challenges of the um, particular challenges that the, the people living on the islands had in terms of access to services, cost, huge cost of transport, people drowning because the, the lake is not safe, healthcare workers serving really um, disparate um, uh, population, remote islands, um, healthcare workers having to travel to outreaches on the islands and then walking for an 
hour and a half when they get over to the island to, to, to find the health center. You know, real problems. And then huge um, HIV positivity rates that unlike what we are seeing anywhere else in Uganda. And it was all of these things, all of this background, that when I started to hear about um, drone deliveries happening, my immediate thought went straight to Kalangala as a possible solution to the challenges that are, are, are being had in Kalangala. So really, as Dr. Darko was saying earlier on, we have to come from a pace of need and then fit the technology to, to, to where the problem is. Thanks, John. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Rose, can you share the screen? We have left, uh, we have left, left uh, Max Ahmed, Ak um, who is part of um, us. He's, a, he's also our panelist here. Hi, um, it's pronounced Mohammed Ahmed. It's the uh, Somali spelling of my name. Um, it's a mutual. I'm just going to share my screen. One second. Can you, you hear me? Him, you have him there. Now. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, perfect. Um, thank you for the uh, invitation, Rosalind and Joanne. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Mohammed. I'm a principal researcher at uh, Microsoft Africa Institute, which is a new research center of Microsoft that just started in Nairobi, Kenya. And what I wanted to talk about initially was the challenges for low resource languages um in as processed in nlp for healthcare but i meandered a bit so i hope that you'll bear with me and um hopefully it'll be food for discussion so for the basics what is uh, natural language processing well natural language processing is not actually one technology but a whole host of technologies that are integral to the processing and understanding of human language um, they are a foundational uh, technology that means that they enable other technologies and they're particularly foundational for processing human language and human language is the medium in which we express uh, human knowledge yeah and at that in a natural setting so we're not talking about how we codify things so for example if you're at a bank um, you see people entering um, data into systems which expect to process data in the format that that software expects. That's not what we're after. We're after human natural processing. Now we can apply, or we traditionally apply NLP to comprehend human speech, human um, in it, both in audio formats and in written formats in order to extract knowledge from that um, information. And in order to tame the vast quantities of data that we generate again, in order to extract knowledge. Um, NLP is applied in many places, and particularly in healthcare, it's applied all over the place, and it's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, we see it applied in everything from um, optical character recognition to clinical documentation to speech recognition so that we can reduce the complexity of people having to interact with machinery or make it easier to be able to interact with other people um, in AI chatbots and in data mining. In short, it's applied in almost anywhere where human language is the form of communication. Yeah, the caveat here is that actually it doesn't work everywhere and it doesn't work well everywhere. Yeah, but the typical goals that it addresses are around how do we scale things? So how do we make do with less resources in order to do more? Yeah, and the other challenge or the other sort of goal of application is discovery. How can we use all the information that we have around us, all the data that we've generated in order to discover something new such that we can expand our knowledge? Yeah, and it's applied with success. So in my previous job, I was working in AI for drug discovery, and this is some of the work that we did, yeah, where we used um, publications in the format of um, published scientific journals in order to extract knowledge to build knowledge graphs. These are structures which enable us to capture the relationships between entities yeah, and then to be able to reason with those yeah, so that we can say what is happening, what is related to what, what is inferred by what. And in that process, we were able to, for example, identify um, a new drug that could be used 
to be able to treat COVID. Now, what do we mean by low resource languages then? Well, uh, a startling fact is that 30% of all living languages today are spoken and used in Africa. Yeah, but if we look for the representation of those languages on the web, what we find is that there isn't a huge amount. So if you take the five most well-represented African languages on Wikipedia, for example, which is a good proxy for what else is out there since it has a lot of contributors, we find that less than 800,000 articles are written in languages that are spoken by more than 230 million people. Now, if you contrast that to rich languages like German, what you find is a language with approximately 130 million people has more than 2.4 or 2.3 million um, articles. That's almost four times the number of the amount of material for a language which has almost half the people speaking it. Yeah. So this is what we mean by languages that have a poor set of resources. And why does this matter? Well, I think this is getting old, but it's true. The, the oil, uh, data is the new oil. Yeah, being able to generate data and access data means that you can build tools on top of that. And machine learning today specifically requires large quantities of data in order to be able to infer knowledge. Yeah, so and the, the, the idea there is that instead of us trying to codify all the possible ways in which we might do something, yeah, we can present the raw data and provide methods to be able to assess how well or badly something's doing in extracting knowledge from there. Therefore, the larger the data set that we provide, yeah, the more examples that we provide in terms of how things should be done. Yeah. And what that means is that we've now got a trend whereby the larger the data size and typically the larger the models that are built on these data sets, the better the performance. So in terms of African languages, now if we go back to them, yeah, being low resource means that we have less data, which means that we're able to build, we're not able to build as good a models as languages that have bigger data sets, which downstream means that the applications are less useful for the people that speak those languages. Yeah, but this isn't just languages. Yeah, and this trend is actually much more than just data, but also wealth. Yeah, if we look at, for example, the tools that are built today, these are tools that are built by big uh, multinational companies that typically cost very many millions of dollars. If we look at the latest models today, um, which do natural language processing, so for example, the things that you're interacting with when you do a web search on Google or when you speak to Alexa or Cortana or anything else, yeah, these things are models that contain many billions of parameters, which require many tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to research them, to build them, to train them, to deploy them. So actually we have a wealth gap as well. Yeah. And now what we're seeing is that these technologies are also becoming foundational in healthcare. So if we look at the US, um, what we find is that over the last 10 years, pretty much all of the US healthcare facilities use electronic medical records and that's some form of electronic medical data capture. What this means is that they're able to actually take advantage of that data now. So if we speak to, or rather recent surveys, speaking to uh, medical practitioners and asking them what kinds of technologies they deploy, yeah, what we see is a new trend. Yeah? New tools that build on machine learning and artificial intelligence are now coming in there and they're actually rising to the top. So for example, here, a survey that was done by Gradient Flow, which is an analytics company, where they asked medical practitioners in the US which functions and which software they currently use and deploy. Yeah, and this is in 2021. Natural language processing is the second most common tool. Yeah, this is a very surprising thing. If you go back less than five years ago, you wouldn't see natural language processing there. This is because of the rapid change in terms of the capacity of tools that are built on these things, which builds on the depth of data and resources available. Yeah, but we have to fundamentally ask who are the beneficiaries. Today, the beneficiaries are not African people or poor people. Yeah. These tools are typically not built with people that look like me in mind, so they don't tend to work very well for my skin color. They don't tend to work well for my um, genetic phenotypes. They don't tend to work well for the kind of conditions that are prevalent in the populations that are not centered in the places where these tools are built and are not dominant in the places where these tools are built. Yeah. So what we actually need, or what I'd like to sort of discuss or put forward is some sort of call to action. 
Yeah, we need better data. We need more data. We need to figure out how we can build these things for ourselves or how to modify them so that they address the kind of problems that we care about. We need to figure out ways that we can combat the wealth bias that exists in the data and the tools that we that are currently deployed and invested in. We need better capture of data and curation of data so that it can be made available to be used to do better things for the African populations. Yeah, we need to discuss what kind of problems we should actually focus on. We have a limited amount of resources. Yeah. No multinational is going to say, take our billions of dollars and apply it to the problems that exist in Uganda or Kenya or Tanzania solely. Yeah, but if we are able to get some access to those resources, we really should focus on them, focus them on the things that do matter. Yeah, we also need to talk about collaboration. How do we pull these resources? How do we pull the small amounts of data that are collected in different places? How does legislation nurture the kind of tools and the methods and the data sets and the collaboration that's required for these things to work? And how do we train the next set of practitioners? And on that note, I'd like to say thank you for having me and I'm open for uh, questions. Uh, thank you so much, Maxamed. For purposes of time, um, let me have uh, Mr. Kenneth Mohanji uh, come up with this uh, presentation, and then I'll welcome um, questions later. Thank you. Kenneth Mohanji, you're welcome. Okay, John, thank you very much. Uh, let me just switch on my video. I'm not sure whether you'd like me to share my screen, but uh, I think we could just discuss, or I could, uh, let me see if I can share this now. There we go. I hope you can all see my screen. Yes, we do. So I'll be looking at just the emerging, sorry, the regulatory frameworks for emerging technologies in the health sector. As introduced, my name is Kenneth Mohanji. I am the managing partner at KTA. And uh, I also advise several other entities on these areas of law that we're going to talk about. And in particular, uh, the drone project is one that I am very passionate about uh, with IDI. And um, I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to get more out of it, especially as Ugandans. With that in mind, really, whenever you're looking at, at uh, the legal and, reg and regulatory framework in any sector, sector. I'm reminded uh, with what happened uh, to economies before the first industrial revolution uh, in the USA, I think that was back in the 1800s. There was uh, a gentleman called James Watt. Uh, this is a guy who had, who had invented the steam engine. And during that time, it was the policy of innovation in Britain and uh, in other sectors or in other, in other places in the world that allowed innovation to be able to flourish. Uh, if you juxtapose that with other uh, entities or other economies like France that were a little more stringent, they were a little more church-based and as such innovation was seen as uh, the devil's work. And that perhaps caused a stall uh, in innovation. So policy is really important in Uganda in particular. We are fortunate enough to have good laws, especially within the health sector. We have policies uh, that govern intellectual property, we have policies that govern innovation. And if we look at laws, you have, for example, the NITAO Act, which basically looks at a certification of any ICT equipment. And then you have other regulations that, that look at uh, innovation, especially within the health space specifically. We can look at the Electronic Transactions Act and the Electronic Signatures Act, which allow you to have a digital signature in order for you to be able to let's say access telemedicine or telemarketing of course then we also have the data protection and privacy act which is more succinct when it comes to uh, information or when it comes to uh, occurrences that are within the uh, collection 
processing and management of data within the health sphere. There are certain restrictions within that act that stop you from collecting sensitive information of which self health information is sensitive information. But thankfully, the act also gives uh, uh, leeways or gives uh, exemptions within which uh, medical entities, especially the one in the e-commerce space or within the e-health space, like the tele entities that the last presenter was uh, talking about, be able to collect and process this data as long as it is in line with the principles of data protection and privacy. Other than that, the other ones, there's a whole list there that I have uh, given to you, but uh, the ones that are specific to that really, I would say you look at the Trade Transactions Act, you look at the Data Protection and Privacy Act, UCC Act, and uh, many of these other acts also come in in relation to equipment, because the, whenever you have software that is uh, that, well, that forms the bedrock of many of these innovations, then they must be if if this those uh, that software must be interoperable used within a particular system especially if you're trying to harness the power of the internet of things where you have that connectivity between software and hardware components so those hardware devices are usually checked and are usually given a go-ahead license from the uganda communications commission so generally uh, the the ministries that would govern ICT or, the, or that would govern electronic health in Uganda would be the Ministry of Health, of course, which would be the primary entity, maybe supported by the Ministry of ICT and the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, which is now under the office of the president. So those two ministries, especially the Ministry of ICT, have come up with several policies that have, that have uh, uh, focused on e-health. One of those is the innovation policy, which was uh, issued by the Ministry of ICT. We also have a policy on intellectual property, which was also uh, issued through a collaboration between the Ministry of Justice and Constitutional Affairs, the Uganda Research and Services Bureau, the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, and the Ministry of ICT. And many of those policies, without policy really, you cannot have any law that is forward thinking. Policy allows you to have a framework, allows you to have direction. And with that direction, you're able to then pass laws that would essentially assist or that would, that would enable uh, the health space especially when we're with these emerging technologies. So other emerging technologies other than drones that would look at are issues to do with robotics and AI, uh, 3D and bioprinting. Uh, we also have nanomachines, blockchain, which is very interesting. It's what's uh, a topic or it's uh, an area which is still 50-50, uh, uh, so to speak, in the context of Uganda, uh, in the sense that many still confuse cryptocurrencies with the blockchain technologies, but our law completely allows both, and in particular blockchain technology. There are several entities now that are experimenting, especially the blockchain network allows you to be able to, that, that allows that element of trust where any records or documents that are kept within the blockchain are kept there for, uh, uh, for forever, so to speak. And it's very difficult, if not impossible, to alter many or any of the entries that are put that also faster and quicker, uh, cheaper to be able to, to share information or data across or even to make payments. I'm sure, especially with the enactment of the National Payment Systems Act, we shall have a lot more technologies that allow uh, payment through, through the blockchain network. And then, of course, the drone technology, which we've seen a video. It's, this is something really that has revolutionized the, the health space in Uganda. And we're really looking forward to seeing that the project is really needed in every most area that we have in Uganda. And even in the, in the, in the urban, sometimes, although you an urban center, it's quite difficult the only way you can be able to, for example, if you're a health center, if uh, you order it from a telemarketing application or from pharmacy or clinics, access to his own services that deliver from motorbike has challenges, especially regarding how the medicines or vaccines, uh, depending on what you're uh, what you're for or what you are transported. And so drone technology, I'm sure, something that would move things faster, move better, especially uh, since any of these drones are crypto-fitted with a uh, cooling system that allow you to be able to transport as a very uh, fragile equipment, very 
uh, or vaccines that are susceptible to, to, to damage. So beyond that, well, of course, we also at, at, uh, at uh, best practice when conducting effective regulation, I think one of the things that we'd look at is the employment of what we call regulatory sandboxes. Many of these technologies haven't been applied before. And if you overregulate, you risk you risk having a situation where you stifle innovation in the sense that many players, I think former uh, to this earlier about how you have a more forward thinking, uh, more forward thinking. So regulatory allow users, allow innovators to be able to like their product online, which is particular in I think the mayor a few weeks ago launched uh, a project on uh, blockchain with municipality and they're allowing people to be able to like innovations within uh, within or, or utilize blockchain. So we're looking forward to having many of those uh, areas where people can like test their products and um, in doing so we feel or think that that will then push the health agenda further to make health access more Ugandans. Beyond that, we're also really formulating a proactive, not really that there is not stuck one of the uh, that is regarding access to medicine and things in particular as we all know not patent pharmaceutical product or uh, medicines because we are categorized as a country and as such we have signed to ascribe to the triple that make it easy for us to be able to reproduce but have to bring on uh, on our patents elsewhere but the, on the flip side, that then makes it difficult for us to discuss again at that level. Whenever we're looking at, let's say, exemptions for exemptions, we saw this uh, when governments came together and make it free for you know for to be able to have the vaccines, uh, the vaccines that we're now using for uh, COVID. So I think when you have active legislation, you factor in things like pandemic that at a time when they come, you must stage where governments collaborate and are able to give exemption or able to lessen or able to reduce or remove any restrictions like for patent for example if we were allowed let's say to patent medicines usually look at three things novelty industry industry application and preventive uh, step but for many of those the reason why we have uh, very low uh, uh, applications or very low patent applications uh, for those of you that uh, are aware, Uganda was ranked 119 on the Global Innovation Index, and that was, that was out of 132. That's quite low. And the reason for that mostly is also because it's very difficult to be able to apply for these, uh, for these, for intellectual protection for many of these innovations. Mainly one, because of course, but number two as well, because innovation is still in nursing stages in Uganda. It's probable that many are actually any applicants are uh, taken away or are excluded because of those stringent requirements before you can be able to apply for patent. I would think having proactive legislation, having proactive laws in our laws would assist in that line and so see many more innovators apply for these uh, for these, uh, these uh, uh, protections and their benefit who arise as a result of you moving forward with I think really that's what I would uh, look at. I will then perhaps just wait for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Uh, one thing I've noted is um, ministries that govern our technologies include Minister of Health and Minister of ICT. And then drone technology is used for transportation of delicate items like drugs and, um, and vaccines. Um, Kenneth, um, emerging technologies present a lot of legal, uh, legal issues. Uh, from the legal perspective, what are some of the key legal issues associated with these technologies? Okay, uh, thank you for that, John. I would say many of the issues that are involved with, uh, with uh, 
sorry, could you just rephrase the question? Are you talking about on the issue of the regulation? Are you talking about uh, the, the challenges that come with the application of these technologies? The challenges. On, on which? The legal point of view. Sorry? The challenges in the, in the legal uh, point of view, in the legal perspective. Not yes. say the practical that is lost in transparency in the sense that you come up with a law, say you have the Data Protection and Privacy Act, which makes it mandatory for you to collect data with the consent of the data subject, but gives all these exemptions, especially for medical use. But however, how do you then categorize research? Let's say medical research. Would you say that that is for medical use because there's not there's before the research is finally out, you cannot have answered the question or problem that you have or that you have posed. So I do believe that some of the challenges really are really that reconciliation, but the application of looking at the application of the law one from the you know from from the time it is enacted or from the time it has come into force vis-a-vis uh, -vis or compared to the time when it is actually. Uh, now uh, being applied or implemented within the health space. I think that is something that, that, uh, that, that proves or provides a challenge. Number two is of course the sensitization on these laws. We have very many laws and we have very good laws, but the challenge comes in in the sense that many people do not know that these laws apply. And that's how you find that for many clinics or many health centers, even when they are dealing with sensitive information, they won't know about this data protection and privacy act. What is this creature that we are talking about? And so you find that you go to a medical center and someone will shout from there, hey, we're Kenneth Wally, uh, uh, results are out, you're positive with this and, uh, and this. And you know this is something that happens a lot. And especially again, during COVID, we've seen that during vaccinations, they call out national ID numbers clearly without uh, having any regard to privacy, without having any regard to data protection. So I think that sensitization is something that is missing or is something that is key if we're to have full compliance with these laws. Perhaps the third uh, and final thing is the nature of law, the nature of uh, society, the nature of industry. It's ever changing, it's ever dynamic. And it's very difficult to enact or adopt laws that are always moving with the times. And so you find that for many laws, they are still stuck in, in, uh, you know, in the past. And it is uh, difficult or you need legislators that are always on their game, always watching out for these things to be able to bring uh, these laws in, uh, to move these laws forward. We're fortunate that for many of our laws, they're flexible enough. For example, our Copyright Act, which without it would not have many of these applications uh, getting intellectual property protection under copyright. That particular act in particular was passed in 2006, no, 2006 or 2010, one of the two, but that was really before uh, social media in particular was as prevalent in Uganda or the internet was as prevalent in Uganda. But you see that many of those provisions there, especially the, 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 the authority to be able to register copyright for software and the other restrictions that exist therein as to how you can be able to use your particular platform. We see that, you know, that such laws have actually moved with the times. So I, I think, John, those are the three main things that I'd look at. There are many more, but uh, de depending on how far the question goes. Thank you so much, Kenneth. We have some questions in the chat. Yes. Um, and so the question is, data sharing across countries is still a challenge, especially medical data. What legal framework should be used for data exchange? Uh, thank you, Dr. Rizzo. That, that is a very good question. How about data protection and privacy act? And one of the key the cross-border transfer of data. So of course, since we live in global environment, we also be cognizant of other laws. So other laws that we can look at would be like the GDPR in Europe, if you're transferring data to Europe. I think that is uh, the one piece of legislation that I'd look at that touches many countries. And uh, the application of that law actually also extends beyond borders, beyond Europe to Africa, to Uganda in particular. So I would say that if you're transferring data to, to Europe, you'd have to look at both laws concurrently, the Data Protection and Privacy Act and the GDPR. 
key is that uh, in, in both of those pieces of legislation and in many pieces of legislation that involve data protection and the cross-border transfer of data, one of the key things is ensuring that wherever you send data, it must be to a, loca to a, to a, to a location that is or to a country or say to a nation that is intentional about data protection. So you can't send sensitive data, especially health data, to a country that does not have reciprocal arrangements for the. Another presentation we ought to go to it because we need to finish by one. We should have finished our last time. Beyond that, what what the two laws also provide is all uh, standard contractual clauses. So these are ones even when those countries do not have any laws or do not have uh, the same cover of protection comes to privacy or data protection, you can employ contracts where you have standard clauses that you could share this data in a manner that does not infringe on any laws either in the receiving country or in the country that is uh, selling that data. So I would say would have the, the transfer of data really is dependent on the jurisdiction uh, from uh, where the data is coming from. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. We have um, with us uh, Richard Indahiro uh, from UNCDF. Um, yes, Richard. Yes, John. Uh, yes. Uh, happy to be here. You want me to Thank go you. ahead? Yeah, Richard. Uh, uh, can you please discuss the feasibility and uh, viability of the drone technology in your setting or in our setting? Uh, thanks a lot, Joan, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here to discuss about the, the topic, uh, which is a topic we've uh, at UNCDF picked up and are very glad to be partnering with uh, IDI, uh, who are really very experienced in the health sector. The, the aspect of feasibility and viability of drone deliveries is actually, I think, core to the project we are currently undertaking with IDEA in, uh, in West Nile. And basically, emerging technologies today, most of them are, some of them are actually castigated to be technologies that are looking for use cases. But th that would be a negative comment to, to apply to drones. And what we are trying to do with this project is indeed to try to find the right use case that would be uh, relevant for the people of Uganda, especially those at the, at the, at the last mile. I'd like to just pick on something that uh, Dr. Rosa said, which was technology that solves problems. So at the heart of really what drives some of the projects that we implement at UNCDF is what can technology do? and three aspects come into consideration for the last mile, sustainably and at scale, and then uh, to be able to change market systems. And we try to uh, assess that through implementing pilot projects like this one, which really test, learn, and then lead to either scale or, uh, or not being able to scale. So, feasibility of drones, viability of the drone deliveries is something that will come out of this study. There have been studies elsewhere on what drones can do. We are able to learn from examples in Rwanda, in Ghana, Madagascar, Mozambique, and all those. It's actually good to note that most of the productive use, use cases for drones have been in the health sector. So the Uganda pilot with IDI and the Minister of Health will help to add more uh, uh, insight into the operational feasibility and economic viability of, of drones. Some of the things we are looking at that should inform uh, the feasibility and viability, of course, you have to look at the flight range. And these are some of the constraints with drone, techno with drone deliveries. Is, things like flight range, payload, the speed, uh, the cost, uh, all those feed into operational feasibility and, and the economic viability. And well, I don't want to call it a challenge, but a reality with drone technologies is that 
feasibility is geography specific. So what works in Kalangala might not necessarily work in West Nile. And it's also use case specific. So by, uh, and this is where IDI becomes a good partner to work with by testing in Kalangala in a different setting and going on the other extreme to test in another hard to read geography like, uh, like Moyo allows us to have two comparative examples that would help us come up with uh, good insights about what's actually feasible for Uganda and be able to share that. So maybe two other aspects of feasibility would have to do with regulation and Kenneth talked a bit about that, the regulatory space being able to enable uh, drone use cases to be piloted and scaled a very huge aspect that we discuss a lot with IDI is the aspect of expertise, uh, trained personnel, not just the pilots, but also being able to build and retrofit drones locally, but also the availability of trained um, personnel within the health sector to be able to work because it's a value chain. It's not just the flying of the drone, but also everything around that use case that we, we are uh, trying. Then connectivity, we were in Moyo last week and um, yeah, aspects of mobile network, how good is the GPS, all those feed into how feasible uh, a drone operation will be. Dr. Rosa talk, talked about aspects of social cultural uh, perception and acceptability of local communities. It's another one that feeds into uh, the feasibility of, of, of such thing. And, and uh, lastly, really is about being able to learn from other, 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 other programs. Like I said, there are a couple of countries already that have some results. Mozambique already talks of uh, achieving 2% increase in uh, vaccine availability. Their use case was around vaccine availability in health centers. And from their study, they were able to see that it increased, uh, drone deliveries increased vaccine availability by 2% and reduced the cost in logistics by 20%. So hopefully from our study, we'll be able to also learn uh, about how feasible it is and, and, and what type of uh, uh, economic dividends we, we achieve. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Richard, uh, for uh, coming up with them. Um, a good conclusion of the feasibility of use of drones. One of them you said uh, is um, the geography of the places, the availability of uh, trained staff and the regulatory space. Uh, members uh, online, in case you have a question, uh, kindly feel free to uh, put it in the chat. Uh, we shall get it and we shall we direct you to a specific uh, presenter. Uh, we have with us uh, um, Mr. Olasupo. Mr. Olasupo. Shupo. Yes, Mr. Olasupo. You're welcome. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, I do hear you clearly. Okay, and you, can you see my screen? Yes, I do. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. Well, it's still morning here. Good morning, good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Olashupo Yedepo. I'm gonna try and do this quickly, hoping I can still communicate quite clearly. Um, I'm hoping that at the end of my presentation, I would lead off, I would leave us with some ideas of thoughts we should ponder as we deploy emerging technologies in health. Um, we've heard a lot about the value of these technologies in the health space. We've heard about the critical need for structured and useful regulation, regulation and legislation that does not stifle innovation. And um, so I'll just like to add my voice to that. 
So essentially, emerging technologies are supposed to be technologies whose development and practical applications are still to a large extent largely unrealized. What this means is um, we have no idea how much we can achieve with these technologies. We have no clarity of the extent or the limit of these technologies. These technologies are very similar to what are known as exponential technologies. Exponential technologies are those technologies that facilitate a change in our way of life that is so accelerated and exponential. Once again, we have no idea of where it's going to. Now, as these technologies are aggressively changing our world and the very way we live our lives, either through cost reductions or innovation, in things like increased computing power, better bandwidth, data storage, or even just our ability to crunch data, there are a couple of things we should ponder as we consider this. According to PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, a report that they released, I think early last year, these are supposed to be the eight top emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, robots, drones, we've heard a lot about drones today, virtual reality, augmented reality, blockchain, the internet of things, Kenneth was talking about this, and 3D printing. We've had all kinds of stuff that's happening with 3D printing. They are actually 3D printing houses now. There's some work to explore if 3D printing can produce organs to hopefully meet the huge shortage of organs the world needs for organ transplants. These are some of the top applications of um, emerging technologies in the health space. So it's either early detection, diagnosis, supporting, decision-making, research, training. There's several other applications. This is by no means um, exhaustive or comprehensive. But there are a few things we also should, like I said earlier, consider. Now, these technologies can help address what I refer to as the four largest challenges of delivering healthcare, issues around access. Um, Rosalind and her team are hoping to meet the access issue by using drones. There are challenges around funding and cost. There will never be enough money to meet the health needs of the people. There are the challenges of human resources. It is anticipated, I think, that by 2030, there would be a deficit of almost 12.5 million health workers across the world. Issues of service demand. We are growing older. Um, as a human race, we are steadily growing older and that's putting a lot more demand on the health services that are available. And imagine technologies can step in and really help to address some of these challenges. However, we need to be careful. We need to, in my view, consider some unique challenges in healthcare. First of all, human life is at stake. For every error that we make, there's the possibility to wound or completely terminate human life. There are greater demands for transparency. There's a critical need for equity and fairness in the way we deploy these technologies. Mm -hmm. And again, something Kenneth has alluded to, we need to consider issues of confidentiality and privacy so that as we deploy these technologies, we're sure and we're certain that they're not exacerbating any of these issues. Now, let us think about this in the African context. Africa is home to 1.3 billion people across 54 countries and 10 ter territories. We're the youngest continent on this planet. The average age on the African continent is 19 years. At least 77% of our population are below the age of 35 years. This becomes critical if you consider the fact that the younger a person is, the more amenable that person is to change. Research has shown that the younger a person is, the more likely that person is to adopt, trust, and utilize technologies. So this can be an advantage for the continent. But however, we have huge challenges, infrastructural challenges, human capacity challenges, poverty, we all know the story. So this means our infrastructural investments 
if we are to survive, we need to be smarter and more strategic. We may need to move away from some of the brick and mortar solutions we have deployed in the past, particularly in healthcare. And imagine technologies can help address these challenges, especially in healthcare. However, like I mentioned earlier, we need to be sure the benefits outweigh the risks. Now, this is where ethics, ethical frameworks and regulation can seriously help us do this, addressing those challenges while being sure that the benefits outweigh the risks. To a large extent, ethics and regulation are essentially a moral authority, either through principles or values for our actions or our activities. Um, they can form a foundation for developing standards, acceptable processes, essentially for governance and regulation. Um, they help to curate and disseminate best practices. This is important because we cannot curate or disseminate what we do not know. So we're back to discussing this challenge of capacity. Now, these are critical to help benefit, like I mentioned earlier, benefits against risks. And to a large extent, they are dependent on some sort of consensus, compromise, respect, and acceptance. Without any of those in place, we will not have some sort of agreement or concurrence on what will guide us. And to a large extent, they vary, sometimes subject to culture, jurisdiction, and the regulatory environment. So this um, emphasizes the need for whatever sort of ethical frameworks or regulation we're coming up with for using these technologies in health on the African continent needs to be contextual. They need to be designed to fit our African situation. Now, Kenneth had mentioned a lot of the regulations that exist in Uganda but most of them are replicated across the continent. So there are regulations like um, data protection regulations, cybercrime, cybersecurity, consumer protection, um, stuff like um, uh, electronic trans, uh, transaction regulations. There are all kinds of regulations that while they may not be specifically targeted at emerging technologies can be applicable to imagine technologies. And on a final note, I would like to leave us with a quote, not from me, but from the CEO of Google. This quote was made in 2020, and he was talking about artificial intelligence. Now, there is no question in my mind that AI, I paraphrase this to read, there's no question in my mind that artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies need to be regulated. They are too important not to. The question should not be a how. The question ideally should not be an if, it should be how do we best approach it. Thank you very much. I hope we will consider this as we discuss further on the best way to deploy emerging technologies in health. Do have a lovely day. Uh, thank you so much. Um... Uh, Mr. Olasupo, Yedepo. Uh, we have um, a few questions. Uh, I would ask uh, uh, what type of uh, regulatory approach uh, should government take to regulating these technologies? Um, so my view would be, first of all, the regulatory approach needs, needs to be contextual. Across the African continent, almost every country has put in place some sort of data protection regulation or the other. Most of these- So there's some questions in the, in the chat. Um, for, okay. for Kenneth, the question is, at Kenneth, how do we handle IP issues for innovations which an institution has been partly supported by another? Yes, uh, Dr. Rosa, I don't know if it's okay for me to answer that now. I yes, hope you go ahead. 
Okay, so again, we have very good questions in the chat. I, I think uh, people are very attentive today. Um, uh, my brother, Obek, thank you very much for your presentation. I'll just quickly just touch on the IP context before uh, we can be able to move on. In Uganda in particular, for those of you that remember, there was that issue with COVIDx, and this is something that you know has been on our lips uh, a lot, where Professor Guang developed a drug which is supposed to help, I think, from the therapeutic side when you get COVID. And the question was whether he owned it as an individual, or whether it was a university that owned it. Now, IP generally belongs to the author, the person who has created the work, the person who has expressed an idea. But the exception, or in this, in this instance, there is in law something they call an employee invasion, where if it's created in the, in, the, in the course of employment, that is, if you're working for a university, if you're working for a company or any research center, then that IP would belong to the employer, the person who has paid you to be able to create. If there's anything that you have created outside the scope of that employment, let's say if you were uh, hired as a, as, a, as a researcher and then you turn from researcher to innovator in the sense that you then create a particular drug, if let's say your research is purely theoretical. And so any such application or any such uh, device or, or any such product would then, in essence, after court has considered whether you used uh, resources of your employer, whether you uh, were, whether within your employment contract you were asked to be able to to produce what you have produced, or really anything that is in your contract or in the nature of your employment. If you can answer all those questions in the negative, then most likely you will own the innovation that you have come up with. So IP really belongs to the author or in the alternative belongs to the employer who is also categorized really as an owner. So, and that's why the law provides that distinction really whenever we are teaching IP, we try to put that distinction between an author and an owner. They are the same, but whenever you're talking about employee innovations, an employer can also be the owner or the author of a piece of work. I hope that answers. I, I think maybe, maybe, Kenneth, the question was also about what if like a funder um, funds a project that develops IP? Ah, okay. So if a funder develops a project, then again, that would depend on the research uh, agreement on the contract, if you're if you're setting up a joint venture, whatever the vehicle, whatever vehicle that you, that's what would really determine who owns the IP in the product or in the version of created. So that would be really good in the absent yeah. agreement. Your, uh, in different yeah. It was clear that whatever you are producing perhaps would go towards a certain initiative, but which is run by the most likely then the IP funder. So, uh, in but if have if, if a funder has come to you uh, to fund an already existing research project, then it may be difficult for the funder to claim any IP if, especially if there's no clause that talks about that. But in general, I think from my so you can see that everything really depends on what you have agreed, what contracts to moving forward with the risk innovation that you have come up with. So that's what, and that's why it's important to be able to sign contracts or have people look through these contracts to determine who owns the IP. Dr. Rosa, if I may just compliment on that, if you don't mind. Yes, Richard. Yeah, so just an example from, uh, well, the donor or funder and, and, and grantee relationship, but UNCDF, we support a lot of uh, innovation work. And indeed, like Kenneth just mentioned, what is in the agreements or in the contracts is that the IP remains with the innovator. We are very clear on what we want to learn together and should be able to publish openly. So IP remains with the, owner of the innovation, 
and we specify areas of learning that we will be able to share openly with the rest of, uh, of the community and, and the public. That's an example from my end, thanks. Thanks. Um, and there is one more question from in in the chat. So the the question was, um, uh, how do you? I, I think the question in the open chat was, um, what mechanisms are in place to address dual use concerns with emerging technologies? Um, so so I asked the the question person to clarify this. And um, the answer is some emerging technologies have harmful alternative uses. And we wonder what mechanisms are in place to review and monitor um, those. I don't know if uh, anybody wants to take that question. I can maybe take it from a drone's perspective, Joanne. I can speak to that if you want, Rosalind. All right. Okay. So um, certainly for um, for for the drones project, I mean, I, I think Kenneth mentioned it in his talk. You know, drones have been really, you know, were first developed in the minist you know, in the military and used for military operations. Um, to, to begin with before uh, anything else. Um, what, um, you know, what I think um, are the fail safes in, in our project, for example, are the huge number of approvals and openness about what we have to do with, with everybody involved. So getting Ministry of Health approval, Ministry of Defense approval, CAA approval, but then also at a district level, working with the district authorities, working with the communities. When you know the drone flies, everyone can see it, right? It literally makes itself known by being up in the air and making noise. So you can't hide, you can't hide this thing. It, 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 it's pretty open and, and, and obvious. And I think, you know, for us, um, the, the fail safe mechanism is to, um, you know, make sure that, um, you know, we are working with everyone. And I think that the way that we got our permissions was every agency wanted every other agency to sign off. There was not one agency that was covering this project and we had to get all of the approvals before we could start. Um, but, 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 um, um uh max um max would like to um uh also answer as well so over to you hi um this is mohammed at uh, microsoft um i think this is a really interesting question on several fronts um starting with the differences between what we know and what we don't know so the the, the known unknowns and the known um is it, uh, and the unknown unknowns is a big one here. Um, take machine learning, for example. There is a lot of emergent um, properties that come out of the virtue of building something and a lot of unexpected uses that are not easy to foresee and that are potentially harmful. Um, a case in example that's quite um, meaningful today is, for example, um, disinformation and misinformation. So a lot of technologies that were developed in order to simply do better optimization, for example, generative adversarial networks are now being used in order to generate um, uh, faces which are then used to disinform people. Or for example, um, natural language um, engines are being used to generate text, which is then used to misinform people. Now, we can argue that those kinds of uses should have been foreseen. Um, and even if they were foreseen, it's difficult to control them. So one of the reasons that um, one of the most powerful sort of models for this kind of technology, GPT-3, isn't publicly released is the worry that it will be used to um, generate um, misleading information. So people might just prompt it with the kind of information, the kind of sentences that they wanted to generate false information in this case, and just have it spit out that kind of information. Now, because these things aren't 
easy to foresee, are not necessarily easy to design against. It's very difficult to come up with ways that they should be um, controlled. And what's happening now, in at least in my field, is much more acknowledgement that this is the case. So people are putting together regulatory um, authorities, regulatory processes, um, and are starting to discuss how we should think about these problems. So the ethics around machine learning, um, what we should do in order to try to foresee how these things might be used and how we can design systems such that we can at least make it difficult to do these kinds of things is something that's beginning to come up. And in most big companies um, today, if you're developing a technology, and especially if you intend to deploy that technology, there are AI ethics boards that you have to go through. Now, they can't answer or at least put forward all the questions that you need to be able to answer in order to guarantee that whatever you've developed doesn't do X. Um, it's not easy to understand whether whatever you've developed is not going to do X simply because it's difficult to control for so many different parameters. But people are at least starting to think about these dual use cases and are starting to put together frameworks to understand how to react when things do happen. Thank you so much, Maximil. Um, in case there's a question, kindly ask. But I think we're getting uh, out of time. Yeah, there is one more. Um, um, all, all, all also okay. Yes, uh, Mr. Shuku. Okay. Um. Thank you. Um. Like Max said, to a large extent, there. To be honest, there's very little regulation that can stop unethical use. However, um, in recent times, the, there's been an upsurge in the interest of addressing ethical and unethical use. And the best that can be done, in my view, as a framework to address this is the consistent discussion the consistent use casing and building of scenarios. And the same way you will develop use cases and scenarios of how your technology will be applied. You then need to apply that same kind of thinking to what if, what if it is used wrongly and see what kind of checks and balances you can put in place. One, before it is misused. And then two, what kind of punitive or uh, enforcement regimen you put in place after it is abused. There's a law that says, though you shouldn't steal, but no law can actually stop anybody from stealing if he sets out to steal. But that same law dictates action that should be taken if someone then goes ahead to steal. So that, that's, that would be the way I would suggest it be approached. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shupo. At, at this uh, point in time, uh, maybe the speakers can summarize, have a summary. We can begin with um, Max Ahmed Ahmed uh, as, we, as we summarize to, uh, towards closing the session. Max Ahmed, do you have something? Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting us and for organizing such an interesting discussion. Um, the thing that I'd like to leave in people's um, thoughts is um, this technology is being developed. Um, who is it being developed for? Um, who are the stakeholders? And um, frankly, if we want these technologies to address the problems that we care about, we have to figure out ways to contribute. Um, that means both legislatively and practically. So how do we go about building partnerships the tools, the processes, and training the people that um, are able to contribute. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's where I'd like to leave it. Thank you so much, uh, Maximil. Kindly not go off uh, because we shall need a picture together as um, uh, people of the same session. Uh, Mr. Kenneth Muhanji, can you uh, say something? Yeah, sure. Um, just really just want to add my thank you for having such 
discussions, especially on this issue, talking about multi in the next few years. But even now, as we speak, since we plan repeat project, which is really a game changer when it comes to delivery of our medicines. So I am thankful for the for the invitation. And I also do hope that uh, we can be able to these discussions. There was a question have, and I really think we have an evidence base to bring where we're not over cautious, but rather the evidence whether a particular piece of technology is what has, and then see how to apply that particular technology within is that we live in. So thank you very much for inviting me. Kenneth, before you you summarize, there's a question here. How yes. do we qualify drones work legally? It's IDI to first pilot this in the country. How do we qualify drones work legally? Yes. So drones have specific legislation in Uganda. You have guidelines and policies that have been issued to authority, but this won't go on for long. I know that they are discussing that uh, lawmakers having to be able to have a comprehensive law on leveraging or use of drone technologies within the country. So at the moment, since I mentioned my proposal for kind of legislation that works is an evidence-based approach, and that's what Uganda has, in a sense that IDI can be able to execute, carry out a drone project like the one that they have done or the one that they're carrying out because of those leeways or because of uh, allow because of the government really being more forward thinking when it comes to deployment of these technologies. So all you have to show is how you're going to project and also perhaps uh, that will guide as to, you know, things like line, uh, things like uh, use of any other issues really involved in the deployment of technology. But I must add as well that in coming up with these pilot projects, I think IDI really has, is at the cusp of something bigger in the sense that using or utilizing uh, the documents or the you know the challenges the successes of, of a reason this project it's very is it is easier now for government to be able to use many of the things that have been learned from this project to go into the legislation and perhaps to also be able to uh, motivate or inspire many other projects because as uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, my colleague from uh, from the alliance had uh, mentioned we we really don't have all be able to execute all these projects. I think players that come in, especially since they all have that that uh, mind for them or the mind for helping the communities. I think projects like like the IDI project go a long way in preparing primers or, or what we call uh, documents that can then be followed by other drone operators in the region. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Kenneth, for that summary. Um, um, Mr. Olasupo Oyedepo, can you give us a summary? Yeah, um, first of all, I would just like to say thank you very much for inviting me. This is a very interesting topic. Um, in summary, I would say we need to look at collaboration. If you look at the European Union, there's a collaborative effort around artificial intelligence, IoT, 5G, emerging technologies across the entirety of the European continent that allows them to leverage their strengths and show up their weaknesses. And that is something Africa is going to have to get on board with. Um, the AU's just proposed something called the Malabo Convention. I think they're trying to get enough signatures for it to work. But it's essentially a convention on cybersecurity across the continent. Now, when we begin to look at conventions and frameworks like that around data protection, around AI and other emerging technologies, Africa would most likely be in a better place to truly gain the value of these technologies within our context. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Lasuko, for that insight. Uh, Dr. Rosalind, can you kindly summarize and conclude the session as we go for a photo shoot? So, so thank you. As, as somebody who's actually, you know, do, doing the implementation, but also, you know, thinking about um, the the conference. I'm just you know so grateful that um, you know we've we've been able to have these these open frank 
discussions. What we will be doing with these discussions is um, trying to summarize them into either kind of frequently asked questions or, or policy briefs that can go on our website, but also that we can share. So that, um, you know, if, if questions are asked by policymakers or funders or whatever, we, you know, we have some we have some ready answers there. So, um, you know, we will share the draft of the, the session brief with you, with, with you as speakers, um, you know, but we're really grateful for, for your input and, 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 and for your advice. I have to say, I'm really excited it, about this conference. We've been doing this since 2018, I think was our first conference. And to begin with, it felt like we were in our own echo chamber. And I mean, I know Kenneth was there at the beginning, but there wasn't such a kind of, we hadn't managed to connect with such a body of people, um, uh, you know, around the region and around the continent that, that we have. And today I'm really excited, not just this session, but in many of the others, we are, you know, I feel that we're talking to a group of like-minded people and, 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 and there is this kind of wave of, um, wave of technical expertise and people thinking about policy and people advocating for improvements and it's just really exciting to to kind of feel that we are not you know we're no longer in our small little echo chamber we may still be in an echo chamber but at least it's a bit bigger <laughs> a bit bigger than it than it has been so um it's really great like i said in my other session i hope that this is the start of a conversation not the the end of a conversation and it would be great you know i think we could have gone all day on this particular topic like on other topics and it will be great to touch base um with people um uh, afterwards this afternoon just to let you know, this afternoon we've got a World Bank presentation between two and three. Um, especially we've got the digital health specialist from the World Bank and a, a senior economist on digital technology. Then at three o'clock, we've got three breakout sessions, one on data security and privacy, Hello. which might be interesting to, to this group. Um, one on AI and gender, which I, I think, Max Med, you're, you're coming to as well. Um, um, we're looking forward to a really interesting discussion specifically on AI and gender and some of the challenges and, and, and issues around that. Um, and then there's a One Health session um, this afternoon on um, you know, One Health and Global Health, um, combating outbreaks and, and climate change and, and some activities that are happening in that area. The conference does continue tomorrow um, as well. And there's kind of a bit of an East African perspective uh, tomorrow. Um, so I hope um, that you have all got um, the link for this afternoon's sessions. Um, if you don't join, thank you for being with us now. Um, if you are joining, we look forward to seeing this afternoon. And if you wouldn't mind all turning on your cameras, even our attendees from around the world and elsewhere, if we could all turn on our camera, it'd be really nice to get a screenshot of everybody uh, in this session just for a second so that we can, um, so that we can, um, uh you know take it take a picture of everyone kenneth you're on the move um and now you're back in your beautiful i'm very envious of your big blue chair kenneth i'm gonna have to ask you where you got it from it's very nice um so um thanks everyone if anybody hasn't got their camera on uh do you want your camera so we can just see you and then we can take quickly take a screenshot we need our host there she is Okay, Annette, stay there, or uh -huh. uh, stay there and we'll take the screenshot. Okay, smile, everyone. Okay, brilliant. Okay, lovely to see you all. Um, um, over to you, Joanne, to say goodbye. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rose. I think um, our session is uh, concluded. <laughs> Members can join us in other sessions. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Okay, did you